Languedoc Roussillon region of France is one of the most evocative destinations in the world. And for me, it was love at first sight. I now call the beautiful medieval town of Uzes my home for many months of the year. What better way to share it than with a week-long movable feast? I call those who join me on my guided culinary adventures my gastro nomads. And the south of France is a land of incredible flavours and atmosphere. So come with me. I'm Peter Mathias and this is my culinary adventure in the south of France. In this first episode, I introduce beautiful Uzes and its famous marketplace. I indulge in the French national passion for antique hunting and I get stuck in in the kitchen. My gastro nomads arrive and the week long dinner party off to a sparkling start. There are no philosophical crises in the south of France, it doesn't exist. You eat, you drink, you make love, you work, you laugh, and then you just start all over again the next day. And Uzez is a magical place that you can't just pass through because passing through intimates that you've been unmoved, that you've been untouched, which is impossible because it's so beautiful. And it's only when you leave that you realize why you have to come back again. Uzez is one of France's 500 designated art towns. It is a real gem of a medieval town with very old houses, narrow medieval streets and lofty towers. In fact, when I go shopping, I never take the boulevards. I always take these little narrow streets because I love them so much and you're always saying it to people you know. The other interesting thing about Uzez is that it houses France's highest ranking ducal family. In fact, the Duchess and the Duke still live here in the castle. You can tell when they're in residence by the flag. If it's flying, they're home. It dates back to the Middle Ages with additions from the Renaissance, the 17th century and modern times and has a checkered history of love and neglect. Now it's fully restored, open to the public and sports the best view in town. But you'll find the lifeblood of Uzes cloistered beneath a glorious collection of sycamore trees right in the centre of town. It's the twice weekly market. This market in Uzez, in the central place, which is called La Place aux Herbes, is the reason that I fell in love with Uzez. It's a very old market. It has been a market here every Saturday since medieval times. We're very lucky to be filming in September because it's autumn, it's the beginning of autumn and it's the harvest time, it's when they start bringing in the grapes, when they start bringing in the olives next month and already the, um, the mushrooms, the wild mushrooms are starting to come in. Uh, these are trompettes de la mort, which is literally translated as black uh, death trumpets. <laughs> Absolutely delicious. This market isn't quite so packed with visitors at this time of year, so I can catch up with some of the storeholders who've become my friends, like Annie a local goat farmer and cheesemaker. She's been coming for 20 years. She comes because she makes people feel better. She brightens them up. <laughs> this area is famous for goat cheese. Pelardon. Pelardon are quite often served, you know, if you get one with your meal, it's quite often served covered in um, olive oil and maybe some Provencal herbs, which is a really nice way to eat it. It's very hard to walk past all these ready food stands, because you're usually hungry when you're shopping. Oh, paella. Ah, oh, smells fantastic, it smells of saffron. I love doing this, I love rubbing my hands over the top of basil because it has the most fantastic smell and this is absolutely the smell of the south of France. They use a lot of basil. 
and a lot of party, a lot of time. This is um, Vervin, which is Verbena. We've got rosemary here. And they use a lot of mint. And I'm going to buy some um, thyme. Nothing like fresh thyme. Yeah, yeah. Ah, no, 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 mais c'est loin, hein? Oui, oui. <laughs> Merci, au revoir. If you order in advance, or if you get lucky, you can get bull meat here. And bull meat is not, it's not the meat from bulls that have been uh, fighting, it's, it's bulls that are bred for eating and their command for small black was absolutely divine. But you know, everything's beautifully marbled, you know, how it should be, because the sign of fat on an animal means it's a healthy animal. The same family of butchers has a boucherie on the far side of the square, and since my order is more than my dainty shopping basket will take, I'll be putting it in the boot of my sporty Renault. Only take away coffee and you did huge hole in the market. Bonjour. <laughs> Ça va? Ça va? This is Mouloud, the main man, the main butcher in UZ. Um, this is um, an Algerian family born in this area and they have the best meat. Um, this is Pelleron. This is the most fantastic cut of meat. It's, it's the shoulder of beef and it's, it's the best for making stews with because it has a lot of gelatinous texture in it. And so what he does is he cuts it in big fat slices that look like steaks and then you cook it for a long time, about four hours, and it just melts away. That's tonight's dinner, but I've purchased the meat for the entire culinary school week, hence holding up the traffic in the narrow street. through the countryside surrounding UZ to the culinary school. I conduct culinary tours in several spots around the globe with groups of up to a dozen people and finding the perfect base camp is always part of the equation. Mas des is a sun-baked quintessentially southern French farmhouse turned guest house. Not only is it a beautiful relaxing place to stay but we get to roll our sleeves up in the mass kitchen for that sensual southern French feeling. I'm also checking in with my business partner, David Horseman, who's off to Nîmes to pick up the guests. Oh, no, there's 10 people in your room. So don't walk around town looking for number 11. She's coming tomorrow. Okay. Good luck. See you later. Bye. Meanwhile, I've got an afternoon of work cut out preparing the welcome feast. There are fennel and goat's cheese tartlets to make, a pizza soup to get on the boil, and a chocolate and almond cake to bake. The star turn is the southern French mainstay, a slow-cooked beef stew called brufado. This is Pelleron, which we saw in the butcher shop. Onion, garlic. This is a really typical recipe from the Long Doc in that they, they use anchovies and capers and vinegar and a lot of olive oil in their stews. It's really fabulous. Spices and orange zest are essential in bringing out the deep, dark flavor of the meat. Too close. You don't need to use too many cloves because they're very strong. This is freshly ground nutmeg. Infinitely superior to anything that's already been ground. This recipe also requires a lot of olive oil, which is mixed in with vinegar. So you pour that over. And then you put your next layer on. And then you repeat the whole process with onions, garlic, orange zest, bay leaves, capers, nutmeg, and cloves, and the rest of the olive oil and vinegar. The brufado is covered and placed into the oven at 150 degrees Celsius to gently stew for three and a half hours. These are my chihol, 
Which I've only just come into the market. You know, the mushroom time is um, autumn, and we're in September now. To clean mushrooms, you never wash them. You just clean them. There might be a little bit of earth on them, but there won't be very much. You just wipe them gently with a damp cloth. These just go with the, uh, the brufado. But as soon as I saw these coming into the market, I said to myself, no, I'm not having potatoes. We're having girole. Now, my hosts at Mars des Oules are Parisiens, who escaped their big city lives to follow their dream of owning a guest house in the south of France. For Jean-Marc and Sylvie Richet, the choice was easy. You want it? Yes. I said to Jean-Marc, I want it. <laughs> so, I want it. Want, I do. As well as having a well-equipped kitchen, there's lots of room for everyone to stay, because originally it was a traditional farm complex, built for extended family and probably the workers too. The surrounding farmland and vineyards once provided for the Saint-Victor Chateau up the hill. Voilà, donc c'était la ferme du château ici, et qui faisait, qui vivait en autarcie, donc il y avait des vignes, il y avait du blé, il y avait des animaux. Ce n'était pas un château, c'était une ferme. Donc, il n'y a pas de noblesse dans l'architecture, mais il y a du charme, beaucoup de charme. Oh, this one's really right. Oh. With a bejeweled fig tree up the garden path, late oh. summer snacks are taken care of. I mean, that's just a hundred percent sugar. Mm. Jean-Marc and Sylvie want to show me their secret spot. Oh my God! It's a Roman, it's a Roman bath. This is where they did their communal washing. The whole village came here to wash. The water is absolutely beautiful. The spring bubbles through a framed tap on the wall. I bet there would have been no men here, and it would have been a hive of female gossip. This is the channel that's carrying the water from the source down to the swimming pool. This is like two, three hundred years old. A lovely place for my guests to bask, but no swims for me. I'm making fresh tartlets, a simple and impressive welcome snack to put in the room for when the guests arrive. Because of course you're always hungry at the end of a long journey. Rolled out pastry is topped with succulent little cherry tomatoes, thinly sliced fennel and goat's cheese. A subtle sprinkling of preserved lemon skin and extra virgin olive oil tops them off and they go in the oven for half an hour. Then they're lovingly garnished with chopped basil, artfully arranged, and delivered by my friend and assistant, Susie. A few days before the culinary week, I enlisted my friend, interior design guru, Charmaine Jack, for a little lesson on Southern French style. We went to what's known as the Brocon market to hunt for a quintessential piece of antique bric-a-brac. Something that would become an eye-catching centerpiece on a dining table. Weekend brocons like this one occur all over the country and the hunt for treasure is actually a French national pastime. New Zealand-born Charmaine, who lives permanently in New Zealand, caught the bug years ago and now she makes a living sorting brocons for private clients. Um, so what might you be looking for today? Well, Pete, often I will come to the Brocon if I've got some event happening in my life. Like, for example, this evening I've got a dinner at the house. Um, I've got something in mind that I'd like to decorate the table with. It's either going to be a fabulous potato, which I can see one over there, yeah. or something tall, um, glass, uh, could be ceramic. This is going to require a keen eye. Spontaneity is, is very important when it comes to um, brocantine. Mm. There's a whole culture around they're coming to these places, isn't there, Charmaine? Yeah. A, a singer is somebody who's passionate yeah. about hunting for antiques, or in a lot of just, cases just they are just a yeah. but, but the French in general are mad about going to places oh, like this, aren't it's they? It's a way to spend um, a morning. 
um, you have great conversation, the atmosphere is always very convivial, um, and of course you see all such beautiful and interesting things. For the stallholders, the brocante is all about lifestyle and love. I love it. The dealers must be officially certified. So there's always a good chance of finding something really good and being able to learn about its origin. Surely you, you, you can win more money when you've got a shop in a good place. Mm. But you're not free. You have to open your shop at 8 o'clock in the morning. Boring. So yeah. it gets seven to you open on Saturday and you don't have any more time to look for... Uh, in fact, what we like. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. yes, this is all about freedom and storytelling. So, so what's the story of this? This is a very, very beautiful yeah. little dish. It seems like a textile, no? A material. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and who's made it? Cremant Toro, it's famous fabric of uh, ceramics. And as I lose myself in countless treasures, Charmaine spots her table centerpiece. It's a yellow, bulgy vase. Stay calm. I do vouch for this woman's sense of style. It is, it is heavy. It's stoneware. Um, the gentleman doesn't really know the history of it, um, apart from the fact that it looks to me it's, it's most likely to be 1950s. Um, and I love it. As in most countries, haggling is an art and a necessary part of the experience. Charmaine does it with a plum. And for the two of them, he's saying that I can have them for 150 which I think by the two pieces together is quite a good deal. He always negotiates, but he always does it politely and gently, so that there's no disrespect on either side at all. And he always gets the price that she wants in the end, and, and they're happy too. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice experience. I mean, if everybody walks away happy, it's, um, yeah. it becomes such a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and it's a, lo it's a lovely thing to be able to do well. Another fabulous thing about this Brockholm is the fresh oyster bar which springs up in the car park. It's somewhere to relax, survey the scene and gloat over what you bought. Just about this market that you, um, especially as the winter months are starting, which they are now, they don't do it in the summer, is to get some oysters and prawns and white wine, bread. Well, that's the best part, is it? Just sitting down and then reflecting on what you bought. And, it's and showing everyone else and having everyone go, oh! You're so lucky you yeah. found that. How much did you pay? You paid. You paid. What? What's the bargain? Back at Charmaine's gorgeous house, while she indulges her other French passion, the art of setting a beautiful table, I spy her personal collection. Very much um, about design, and uh, that's an element that I like to bring to, it's, it's my style, it's my version of French style, basically. Mm. Because the, the Uzes style, as you mentioned, is very neutral, it's very plain, it's very um, pale, a uh, lot of uh, sort of washed out colours. Mm. But I like to punch it up and bring in this element of uh, contrast. This lesson on southern French brocanting and table setting will help inspire the look of my culinary week. I want them to be abundant with the culture and the passion of southern France because, well, when in France, that's just what you do. Well, you know, it, this is a representation of the way that I like to put together, this is my French style, this is my version of French style. Yes, yes, definitely, French style. The late summer sun may be shining, but back at Marseille's all the kitchen is where the heat is on, with just a few minutes up my sleeve before the gastronomist arrives with David from Nîmes. This is a famous um, soup from Nice called Pistou. Pesto is the Provencal word for pesto, and the, the great thing about making pesto at pesto soup at this time of the year is that we've got the, um, the fresh white cocoa beans. Once the soup is served, you plop um, a dollop of pesto, freshly made pesto on top, and then you just fold it into your soup. It is so heavenly, I can't tell you. And normally, um, in most countries, you'd have to buy dried white beans and soak them overnight, but these are fresh cocoa beans. Is heavenly. Into the soup goes a bouquet garni, and a bouquet garni is composed of a bay leaf, a fresh thyme, 
And some parsley. Courgette. Leek. Carrots. Some diced potatoes and tomatoes complete the picture, along with a little water and some seasoning. Some baby beans will go in closer to serving, and I leave it to simmer while everyone arrives. Thank you. Every culinary tour group is different. This one happens to be all women, and they are ready for action. We intend packing a lot into the next seven days. A schedule which David and I will run with military precision. Not that anyone will know it. So relaxed and on holiday will they feel. I think David suddenly realised that he's the only male in a sea of females and that his work is cut out for him. We all sit down for a briefing. And as it turns out, there's a birthday in the house this very day. So while everyone enjoys their G&Ts and freshens up for dinner, it's back into the kitchen to whip up my favourite celebratory cake. The first thing we do is we melt the chocolate, which is 70% cocoa solid, the butter, cognac, I should have done that about an hour ago, a couple of tablespoons of coffee and that we take to the stove and gently heat and the minute it's melted you take it off and then you tip in the ground almonds and the sugar put a little bit of salt in when you're um, beating egg white And a bowl of slippery goo becomes tight white light, one of the most magical transformations in the world. The yolks then go into the chocolate mix, and the chocolate mix gently in with the white. You fold the egg white into the chocolate mixture. You don't mix them. You have to keep this plate very light because don't forget it doesn't have any flour or baking powder or anything to make it rise. It just has to rely on eggs and the method of making it. Once the mixture is poured in the tart dish, you sprinkle slivered almonds around the outside. And the tarte au chocolat et aux almonds goes in the oven for 45 minutes at 150 degrees. Just enough time to go out and get changed for dinner. My merry bunch of ladies start the evening with pisto soup, garnished with a dollop of fresh pesto and a grating of parmesan cheese. The slow-cooked beef bluffado is meltingly soft and served with slow-cooked tomatoes and pan-fried girol mushrooms. And the chocolate and almond birthday cake inevitably makes its way into everyone's heart. The Culinary Week is off to a sparkling start. So join me next time for ancient history, Michelin starred food, cooking lessons, and a whole lot of bulls. The people of the south of France's Camargue region are absolutely mad about bulls. And I'll put myself on the roof of a truck to find out why. Girl. Oh, God, okay.